So first of all, thanks Andrea, Nike, and Scott for inviting me and for putting this event together. So I realized that I'm the first former PhD student of Amir to give a talk here. <laughs> Obviously, there are plenty of uh, stories to tell about your style of advising, but uh, maybe I will do that uh, offline. So the only comment I want to make is that... Uh, sorry? That's so, um, right, so the only thing I want to say is that, you know, somehow most meetings in life, and in particular meetings with your advisor, tend to have an upper bound. So with Amir, the opposite is true. So meetings with Amir tend to have a lower bound. <laughs> and all conjectured upper bounds on the length of meetings with you were disproven sooner or later uh, during my PhD. So, uh, so thanks a lot for generosity with your time. And happy birthday. Um, OK, so now that we got into the mathematics, so this talk will be about uh, the super cool Stefan problem. So it's, um, a priori is a PD problem, and so if you work in large-scale limits of particle systems, what tends to happen is that you often borrow results and ideas uh, from PDs, and you kind of rarely give something back. And this is, uh, you know, one instance where you can actually um, make quite a bit of advancement on a PD problem using probability. So this will be kind of the main message of the talk. So all of this. Um, it's a series of papers with uh, Sergei Natoshi for the first two and joined with Sergei Natoshi and Francois Delarue for, for the third paper. Okay, so um, what I will do, I will tell you a little bit about the history of the problem, so where it comes from, and um, what the physical motivation is, and then um, we will quickly translate it from PD language into the probabilistic language, and so the main part of the talk will be to show you how you can, what you can do with probability uh, beyond what was done in PD. Okay, so the original Stefan problem was introduced um, in uh, the late 19th century, so around 1890. And um, if you can read in German this, uh, this series of papers by uh, Stefan, it's actually extremely entertaining uh, to read. So the original problem um, he has formulated was about uh, freezing, so formation of ice in the polar sea. So you have somehow, you know, icebergs, so some amount of ice surrounded by water, and you want to understand, you know, how this ice will either melt or, or, or grow. And so if you read the introduction to this first paper, what he says is that, you know, there is a serious concern that uh, a lot of ice will build up in the polar sea, and this will somehow interfere with. Uh, the motion of ships and kind of with naval everything. So, you know, when you read it, roughly speaking, the opposite is the case uh, from today's perspective. But, uh, okay, so, so that was his motivation. Okay, and so, um, so he has formulated a certain set of uh, free boundary problems describing, you know, how this boundary between the ice and the water um, will change over time. The problems are formulated in higher dimensions, but they're really one-dimensional because um, you assume that initially, you know, one half space is ice, the other half space is water, and you know, just due to symmetry, your boundary will move in this one direction, um, then, then, then in which it can move. Um, right, and so, um, and what uh, Stefan has done is he managed to find explicit solutions for different types of these problems. So, with different number of phases and different versions uh, of this problem. So after that, the problem was kind of forgotten. So until 1931, there were, I think, not a single paper, not a single citation of, of, of these papers, uh, as far as I understand, until uh, Brillois gave a lecture on this at the Institute Henri Poincaré in, in Paris. And this somehow sparked a lot of interest. So if you look at the book, by Rubinstein on Stefan problems from about 36 years later. Uh, he says in the introduction that, you know, he estimates the number of papers on the subject to be around 2,500, and so the book is not long enough to accommodate, you know, even the list of references uh, on the subject. Okay, so that's the original uh, Stefan problem, and certainly I will not 
tell you, you know, uh, give you this list of papers and just ma maybe mention one. So there is some consensus that this paper by Kamina Moskaya from 61 is sort of the final definitive solution to the origin of Stefan problem. So what is done there? Um, she introduces the notion of generalized solution that works in any number of dimensions with any number of phases, proves that it exists and is unique, and gives actually a numerical scheme which converges to the solutions in a sense, you know, she, the problem has been completely resolved. So what I want to talk about today is the super cool Stefan problem, which is something that Amir touched upon in his work with Li Cheng, and I will mention that a bit later in the talk. So the super cool Stefan problem is the situation where you take a liquid and you cool it down below its freezing temperature, but in such a way that it remains liquid. So I am was told that in the US, kind of a common experiment you do in high schools is to take a bottle of water, insulate it, so pack it in something like styropor, and then put it in the freezer, in which case the temperature of the water will go below the freezing point, below zero Celsius, but the water will remain liquid. And then you can study <coughs> what happens if you bring this water in contact with ice. So if you say pour it, on a block of ice. And the interesting feature here is that the water is cooler than the ice, so it will actually start freezing as it heats up. Okay, so it will heat up and at the same time freeze. And so instead of telling you in words how this looks, let me show you a video. Right. Right, so here I take super cold water, just pour it into a glass, and this is what happens. And this is, by the way, in real time. Okay, so <laughs> it's really the ice is forming in front of you. Okay, so, um, right, so this is the type of phenomenon that, that we want to understand. So here uh, you already have a piece of ice in the cup, or no? No, there was no ice. It's just so just an empty cup, you take the super cold water, you start pouring, and then that's it. So why did the super cold water freeze originally? Because it was in pressure? No, it was not in pressure, but basically, um, if, if you insulate it, it, it's prevented from forming the crystalline structure. It's um, better stable. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I will not go too much uh, into the physics of that, so what we want to understand is uh, the mathematical model uh, of this behavior. And in particular, um, you know, we want to understand this new feature of, of this um, very quick motion of the boundary that, that you saw uh, in the video. Okay. So, um, so the first paper on the super cold Stefan problem uh, appeared in the 70s. And um, in this paper, it was shown that, you know, there are blocks in the problem, meaning that if you formulate the equation for how the boundary is supposed to move, you will typically find some finite time uh, capital T so that the speed of the boundary goes to infinity. So the rate, the rate at which the ice will grow will go to infinity at this finite time. And this is basically where the PD analysis stops. So you either have a global solution or you have a solution up to this block time. And that's all the PD literature could say. And so what I will try to explain today is that you can use probability to actually go beyond that and construct global solutions of this problem. Okay, so first of all, let me tell you what the problem is exactly. So we will look at the problem in one dimension uh, where this phenomenon of blobs is already <coughs> So um, it's a bit unfortunate I cannot draw pictures, so let, let, let's uh, just keep pictures in our mind. So the capital lambda will be the boundary between the, um, the two phases. So imagine you have, um, so in one dimension, on the negative half line, you have ice, on the positive half line, you have your super cold water. And so lambda t will be the location of the boundary at time t. So by how much uh, has the ice advanced onto the water. So that's precisely this motion that you saw in the video a moment ago. So lambda will be this boundary. Now to the right of the boundary, so in, in the part of the space where the water lives, 
uh, the temperature of the water will solve the heat equation. Um, so that's uh, the first line here. And the boundary will move according to the following rules. So um, the rate at which the boundary will advance will be given by some uh, physical proportionality constant C times the gradient of the temperature. So the, the, um, yeah, the first derivative of the temperature at the boundary. So you, you start with some initial temperature of your supercooled water. It evolves according to this free boundary problem. And the boundary moves according to the uh, first derivative of the temperature at the boundary. So that's the supercooled stuff. So that's, well, it's the fun problem. And what makes it super cool is that we're choosing F and C to have the same sign. So um, in uh, the physical language, you would choose F to be negative and C to be negative as well. But mathematically, it's more convenient to make them both non-negative. Uh, and it will get rid of some um, negative signs. So what is known about this problem, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is that this problem has blocks. So if no matter how nice your initial condition with left is, there will be um, um, situations, so you can find perfectly smooth initial conditions, where uh, so that at a finite time, capital T, the <coughs> velocity of your boundary, so the rate at which the ice will grow, will blow up a a as you approach this thing. And so what, uh, again, the PDE people will tell you is that there is a classical solution to those problems, a solution where all of these derivatives are continuous, up to that time, and that's it. So that was the state of the art um, before we started looking into this problem. So you can ask yourself, okay, where is the probability in all of this? So, so, so far there was nothing random, was just a pure PD problem. Well, turns out that you can reformulate this problem in probabilistic terms. And uh, here is how it goes. So consider the following problem. So you take a Brownian motion, B, started from some initial condition. And you ask yourself, is it possible to find a non-decreasing function, so some function lambda, so that if you subtract it from your Brownian motion, the probability your Brownian motion will die, will hit zero by time little t, will be equal to lambda after this proportionality constant, little, uh, capital C. Okay, so we're looking for a fixed point uh, so, so of, of um, solution of this problem. So we want to subtract something from Brownian motion so that its death probabilities are proportional to this quantity we subtract. Okay, so a priori, this sounds like a completely different problem. But uh, you know, if um, you assume that this function capital lambda that you are subtracting is actually nice, so it's, say, differentiable, let's say with a continuous derivative, then of course what you can do is you can write the forward Kolmogorov equation to the evolution equation for the densities of this process because it's just the Brownian motion this trip. And you get you know, some PDE here. And um, you can also figure out that this fixed point constraint, so the second equation can be rewritten by saying that um, the derivative of your function, so the drift of your Brownian motion, will have to be the derivative of the density of the solution, so the density of yt uh, at the point zero. Okay, so uh, once you derive these equations, you see very quickly that if you subtract, so if it makes a change of variables and go from P, from the one dimensional distributions of your uh, stochastic process to this function U, you will be actually a classical solution of the Stefan problem <coughs> that you saw in the previous one. <coughs> now, yes. Sorry, how is defined T bar? Oh, T bar, uh, T bar is the uh, time you hit zero. Okay, so. So you run this Brownian motion with drift, and the time you hit zero, you stop. And what you want is that the probability that you will hit zero, so that your particle will die, okay. to be proportional to, to, to the stuff you're subtracting. And this implication works the other way around, too? Uh, you have a lambda t defined by your supercooled parameter. Yes, so it exactly. So as long as everything is classical, yeah. everything is smooth, you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two parts. But you see, the advantage of working with the probabilistic problem is that you have now hope to define global solutions 
to this equation, right? Because somehow only lambda itself and not its derivative appears in the equation. So you can try to solve this fixed point problem I have described now for all time, right? So a priori, um, you know, even if you know that the derivative of lambda will go up, then the lambda <coughs> itself will exist for all time. Uh, a question, what, what yes. is the relationship between this xt and y bar t? And there is x. Oh, sorry, that, that oh, should that's be the, the same. y bar t? Yeah, that should be the y bar t. Apologies. Okay, great. So you take this process, you look at its one-dimensional distributions, you get some PD for those, and after a change of variables, you are back in this different problem. And that's the story of the problem. Okay, so now, um, once you have translated this problem into the probability language, you can ask, okay, can we actually find global solutions uh, to, to the super cool Stefan problem? And if uh, the solution is unique, this would somehow give you, you know, the physically meaningful uh, global solution, a global description of the behavior of the ice, even in this regime where you have blobs, so where you have fast motion of the boundary between the water and the ice. Okay, so this is uh, what I want to talk about. And basically, so there are three questions you can ask in increasing order of difficulties. So you can first ask about existence of these global solutions. Then, sort of an exponentially harder question is to ask about the description of these solutions. So to ask, you know, how do these blobs happen and what happens after the blob? So if you <coughs> manage to construct a global solution, somehow these blobs are resolved by the solution in some way, so we will try to understand that. And uh, in the third paper, we you know, answered the, again, exponentially harder question of actually proving uniqueness. Right? So proving that this global solution is actually unique in, in an appropriate sense. Okay, so I'll get to all of that, but let me start with existence, uh, sort of as a warm up. So one way to use probability uh, in general to prove existence for some problems is to build some approximating sequence. So here, whenever you have a PD problem, it's convenient to build some sort of interacting particle system approximate to uh, uh, your PD. And so if you can establish tightness of your approximations, then you will get some limit points. And the limit points, if the solutions of the correct problem, they will uh, give you existence. And so, um, you know, there are two ways we know of uh, how you can approximate the Stefan problem by particle system. So one is due to us and one is due to Amir and Yicheng. So we'll tell you first about our particle system and I'll get to Amir's and Yicheng's particle system in a moment as well. Okay, so here is how our particle system works. So basically, you know, instead of this sort of continuum of particles that are falling the, um, that are governed by the heat equation, we want to discretize uh, this problem. So you start with capital N, N will be of course large, particles on the positive real line. And um, you're trying to mimic sort of this probabilistic problem that you saw in the previous slide. So what does it mean? So you, you, you start um, your, your particles initially with independent ground motions. And again, it would be great to draw a picture, but um, to that they can do it. So imagine you have n independent Brownian motions starting on the positive half line. Initially, they do not interact, they're really independent. Now, the interaction will happen when these processes hit zero, which uh, will eventually correspond to, to this heating time of zero to a bar uh, from the previous slide. And the interaction will go as follows. So if a particle hits zero, it will drag down the other particles. So the rest of the configuration will be moved down closer to the boundary according to some rule, which you will see on the next slide. And so these uh, blow-ups or the singularities on the system, they will correspond to situations where you trigger a cascade. So you have a particle that hits zero. This leads to downward shifts of the other particles. But these shifts can be so large that <coughs> the second particle will cross zero and die as well, in which case we will shift the configuration even more, which can lead to a 
you know, a massive particle, a set of particles crossing zero and dying, and so on. So you can trigger this sort of large cascade where maybe even your whole system will die out at this time or some positive fraction of it, and this will somehow correspond, um, correspond to the blobs uh, in the limiting point. Okay, so let me um, be more precise. So initially, as I said, your particles are moving as independent Brownian motions. You can happily set the drift to zero and the dispersion to one, that there is no problem with that. And so, as I said, something interesting will happen when particles hit zero. So I will look at the, the hitting times of zero by the different particles that they call to i. And so if a particle hits zero, here is what we do. So we will shift the remaining particle configuration by this quantity that you see uh, in the second line, so c times this log. So what does it mean? So c is just the same proportionality constant we had in the limiting problem. And s t minus is the size of the system before this cascade is started. So initially it's capital N, but later on we will have fewer particles, so this will be some number between uh, zero and capital N. Okay, so initially it's capital N, you compute this quantity, and you shift the remaining particles towards zero by this amount. Okay, and as I just told you, so what can happen is that the shift is large enough so that more particles cross zero. So you can have some new particles I1 through IK, which now cross zero because of this shift. In which case, what we do is we redefine the shift from the quantity you saw up there to this quantity here. So we take into account that now k plus one particles have died, so the original one plus the k which was dragged across zero. And now we shift whoever has survived so far by this larger amount. So, right, so, so you have some sort of hierarchical process. So initially one particle hits zero, you shift everybody, now a few more maybe hit zero, you recompute the shift and you shift everybody by this new amount. Now maybe more so particles now, die. So you've shifted everybody by the sum of the amounts or you replace yeah. them one Thanks. by one? That's a, you replace the original one by this one. Okay, so you basically try different values of k and you stop at the k where um, the rest of your particle system survive. Right, so th this is actually a great question. So the important principle here is that we will always choose the smallest number of particles to die out so that the rest can survive. Okay, so that, that's how the mechanism works. Okay, so um, right, and this is just formalized on the slide. So if, if you order the particles, you can define the number of particles that die at a given time by saying that you take the smallest number k so that if you shift everybody else, so everybody above particle rank k by this amount, these guys survive. So that's exactly uh, what I was saying in words before. Okay, and so in other words, every particle, the dynamics of every particle is given by this last formula, so it moves as a Brownian motion, and it accumulates a bunch of shifts towards the absorbing point at zero, and it keep, keeps going according to this formula until it crosses zero and then it dies. Okay, so that's how the particle system works. Any questions on the subject? All right, so now what the, my claim was, right, my implicit claim was that this particle system in some sense converges to the solution uh, of the supercool Stefan problem, and this is how we want to get existence. So let me explain you know, the relation between the two. Okay, so the first observation is that, um, so you should just look at this line uh, from this slide. Right now, so the first observation is that if you sum the shifts to a given particle, so the amount by which it will be shifted up to 10t, it's given by this formula here, right? So du is the number of particles <coughs> dying at 10u, su minus is the number of survivors you have until 10u before you start this cascade at 10u, and you just have accumulated some shift from all of these cascades up to a given time. Now, you can make a very simple computation here. So you first find the common denominator, right, over here, right? So 
this uh, 1 minus the fraction of d over s is just su minus minus du over su minus, so that's su minus here, and su minus the number of survivors before the cascade minus the number of deaths at the time of the cascade is just the number of survivors you will have after the cascade. And so what you realize is that this accumulated shift you have up to time t is actually a telescoping sum, right? So the, each of these logs is really the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator, so everything cancels out except for the number of survivors until all the way until t. So you can rewrite it in terms of the indicators that these particles survive. And from the denominators, the, the only one that survives this telescoping sum is the first one, and that's n. So that's the number of particles initially in the system. Okay, so it means that up to some time t, the amount by which a particle will be shifted towards the absorbing boundary is given by this formula here, which immediately tells you that you have actually a mean field type of interaction in your system, which means that the only interaction term can be expressed in terms of the empirical measure of the system and the location of the particle that you're looking at. So to figure out where particle i will be, the only way it sees that's the particles is you know, through this average here, which is um, just some functional, some linear functional of the empirical measure of the system. Yes? Say, say it again. So, what is exactly this? Um, oh, yeah. So, to i, right. So, to j is the heating time of zero by the j's particle. Right? So, so this indicator says one if your j's particle has survived up to time t, so if it has stayed above zero up to time t. And so, if I take the sum and just count how many particles have survived up to time t. So, you make your particles reflect off each other so they stay over. No, 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 they do not reflect. So they just follow these Brownian motions, dependent Brownian motions, and they have some interaction when one of them hits here. Wait, wait, so okay. are, are these like independent? Are they what? 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 Are they own Brownian motion, all of these Brownian motions are independent, and it will be shifted down by some amount, and this amount, so for every time u, I look at the amount that will be shifted by at time u, and I just accumulate all of these shifts. Yes? The thing is that the D, the original definition, used the order statistics, but yes. actually because of the log, it becomes an order. Uh, it becomes just a function of the yeah, yeah, you can see it this way, but right. So the order of statistics in a sense completely irrelevant. So all, all, all this is saying is that you just look at your particles from left to right, and you figure out how many particles are you shifting across zero so that the rest actually survives this process. Okay, but then the order statistics do not enter the dynamics in any way. All right. Okay, so because you always, so the particles that are closer to zero will be the ones that will die, right? So to define how many particles will die at a given time, what you do, so you, you, your first particle has hit zero, right? You shift everybody else, and if the rest, so if after the shift, the rest of the configuration is still about zero, you are done. If a few more particles cross zero, they will die, and you recompute the shift, and, and you keep going. Okay, so, David, no, no time, can, can we let him finish his talk? Can you go on? You start for five minutes for questions. Why don't you finish your talk? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so. All right, so, so <laughs> the dynamics is, <laughs> there are no local times in the dynamics, okay? And so the order of statistics just enter when you figure out how many particles actually die at a given time. Okay, so okay, so you have this particle system. Again, it's too bad I cannot draw a picture of this. Um, all right, 
So, okay, so we figure out that the total amount of shift to a given particle is given by this formula. And so, um, because uh, the interaction is of this mean field type, so it just inter interact with other particles through this average. Um, you, um, it's well known by um, the, the usual mean field heuristic that you should expect to have a limit of, of your particle system as the number of particles goes to infinity. And what is supposed to happen is propagation of chaos. So your particles, as n becomes large, are supposed to be become closer and closer to independent. And uh, this sort of average that you see here should converge just to the probability that any given particle, so representative particle, survives uh, beyond 10 t. Okay, so if you carry out this heuristic, here is uh, what you get. So you, in the limit, if this mean field heuristic actually applies, uh, what you will get is that each particle will behave according to the solution of the top equation, which is precisely <coughs> the equation we had before, just that instead of this average that you saw on the previous slide, so this average over here, what you will get will be just the survival probability of uh, a given particle. Right, so you got the sort of fixed point problem, again, of the type we saw before. Right, so you run a Brownian motion, and you're trying to find a function, capital lambda, so that if you add capital lambda to, to your particle location, uh, it will be proportional to the log here of the survival probability. Okay, and so you see, except for this log, that's precisely the problem, the probabilistic formulation of the super cold Stefan problem. Now, the log here is uh, maybe to confuse you a little bit, but uh, yes, yeah, so, so you can do everything without the log as well. The reason I put the log is because uh, they have it in the paper, and uh, you know, it, it actually shows you that you can go a bit beyond um, the linear version of the super cool Stefan problem. But for now, you can completely forget about the log <laughs> if you prefer. Okay, so you get this limiting problem. And what you want to say is, of course, that your particle system converges, so it's first of all tight, has limit points, and that the limit points solves this problem, because then you have constructed or you have proved existence for the limiting problem, which was our first goal. Now, compare, if you compare it to kind of the usual uh, situation of um, uh, mean field interaction, you know, in the usual situation you have you, you know, have existence and uniqueness for the limiting problem, and you know, uniqueness tells you that your, your approximation, your particle systems converge, and existence you get either directly or, or from a tightness argument. So here you, you run into two problems. So first of all, is uh, you, you realize that if you look for solutions of this problem in the space of continuous functions, so if you look at continuous functions, capital lambda, that solve this fixed point, there is non-existence. So again, for extremely nice initial conditions, as smooth as you want, away, supported away from the absorbing boundary, um, you cannot find, in some cases, even a single continuous function that satisfies this problem. So this is easy to resolve. You just relax the requirement and replace C by D. So you're now looking for solutions in the space of Cadillac functions. And then existence turns out to be OK. I will get to that on the next slide. The second problem that uh, you, you, you have with this limit is non-uniqueness. Okay, so you can also very quickly construct solutions of this limiting problem, or alternatively, the super cool Stefan problem, multiple solutions for the same initial condition. Now, what is the reason for non-uniqueness? So the reason for non-uniqueness is that there is already non-uniqueness in the pre-limit in some sense. So what you can realize is that if you <coughs> encode, so if you um, take this definition of the overall shift in your original particle system, then already, so if you use this term to define the shift, already there you will have some non-uniqueness. So in other words, this, this way of writing the cascade, so 
uh, expressing which particles survive does not uniquely pin down the dynamics of the system, whereas this original way actually does. And so what is the difference between the two? The difference is precisely that in my original way of encoding the shifts, I have specified that I choose, again, the smallest number of particles that I need to remove so that the rest survives. And so if you include this minimality condition in the limit, which uh, is written here, but don't have to uh, parse the formula very carefully, right? So basically what I'm saying is you, at any given time, you take this you know, continuous density of, of your particles, and at any given time you figure, figure out what is the smallest amount by which you should shift this density so that the rest of the configuration can survive. And so if you implement, so if you add this minimality condition, it turns out there is actually uniqueness for the limiting problem. Okay, so um, how much time do I Five minutes. Okay, so let me get, go into the results. And the results <coughs> are okay, so the first result is that indeed you do get existence. So that's uh, the first result from our first paper. So indeed, these particle systems that I have described, they form a tight sequence. And so, uh, and in, in addition, every limit point will solve the limiting problem with this additional minimality constraint. And so you do get you know, one of these minimal uh, or physical solutions by considering limit points of the interacting particle system. So, uh, so that's one, that's the first result. Now, okay, so once you have existence of these global solutions, which emphasizes the first time, you know, anybody has looked at global solutions from the superfluid Stefan problem, and so in particular, this shows you that these things actually exist. Now you can try to actually understand them um, better. And once you understand them better, you might have hope of establishing actually uniqueness of these minimal solutions uh, for the limiting system. So before I go on, let me just briefly mention, so without a board, I cannot explain this particle system uh, of uh, Anir and Li Cheng, uh, but uh, let me just mention that there is another particle system that Li Cheng and Anir have introduced <coughs> at the same time as us, which uh, also leads to global solutions of the super cool Stefan problem. So there is a second way, so for those of you from more on the discrete probability side, there is a discrete particle system on the integer lattice whose fluctuations actually also lead to solutions of the super cool Stefan problem. So there is another way of proving existence. And maybe I also want to say that by now, in our second paper, we have also established a direct way of proving existence. So there is a way of actually applying um, a version of the Schauder fixed point theorem for the score of hot space, which uh, will give you a, a global solution of the Stefan problem as well. So we have these various ways of establishing existence. So let me actually uh, spend the last few minutes telling you something about the solution itself. Okay, so, and the main question is, of course, you know, what happens to these blocks, right? So you, you, you have these solutions, which now even have jumps. I told you that you have to work with D, so your boundary has actually jumps at, at certain time points. So the simplest thing you can try to understand is, you know, when will jumps actually happen? So suppose you look, for example, at the time of the first jump of the boundary, so the first time the ice will really advance extremely quickly in this problem. And uh, in particular, what you can try to figure out is how does the particle density, in physical terms, the temperature distribution in your super cold water will look like right before you see a jump. Okay, so what has to happen in, in your uh, super cold liquid so that a jump is triggered, so, so that your ice will advance extremely fast, uh, instantaneously. Okay, and, um, okay, we'll not go into other applications of this. So let me just give you um, this main result. Again, uh, we'll have to uh, imagine the picture behind these formulas. So what you do is the following, so I'll do my best to, to explain it. So you have this temperature distribution in, in your liquid, which um, is uh, for us just the probability density on our plot. 
And we want to know how does this probability density uh, have to look so that the ice will advance immediately you know, by some non-zero amount. Okay, and so here is, so we have a sharp uh, nested and sufficient condition for this, and here is how it looks. So instead of the density, suppose you take the CDF. Okay, so look at the CDF of this probability distribution, and it's sort of clear that you have to look at it near zero, near the absorbing point, because that's where, uh, the only place where, um, right, so, so th th this is where particles are absorbed, so th that's a uh, quantity to look at. So you take the CDF, and to trigger a jump, the following has to happen. So the CDF, first of all, must have a non-zero slope at zero, meaning that your temperature at the boundary has to deviate from zero. So initially, <coughs> as long as you're in this classical regime, you have a classical solution, your PD problem has a Dirichlet boundary condition at the boundary, right? You, you keep absorbing your particles at zero, so you, you, you prescribe, physically prescribe the temperature at the boundary, and in terms of particles, you prescribe that zero is an absorbing boundary, so you have a zero Dirichlet boundary condition. So what I'm saying is that at these jump times, <coughs> the particle density at zero will actually jump to a non-zero value. So, so even before the jump is triggered, so as you approach the jump, the value of the particle density will become positive. And in terms of the CDF, it means the CDF will have a non-zero slope at zero um, right before a jump is triggered. And there is a critical threshold. So roughly speaking, it, you, what, uh, the critical threshold is one over C, this constant parameter of, you know, so like a coupling constant in, in our equation. And so if the slope of your CDF, in other words, the particle density is not only positive, but actually exceeds the threshold of one over C, you will have a jump. And this turns out, so the appropriate formulation of this condition turns out to be necessary and sufficient. Okay, so this is how, how, how the blow-ups are triggered in the solution. Okay, so we'll not have uh, much time to say anything beyond that. Yeah, two minutes. So let me just mention a few things uh, from our paper with Francois, the, the, the one which, is, uh, which will come out in, in the next few weeks. Um, so what turns out to be happening is actually much more delicate. So it turns out that there are two types of blobs in this problem. So there is a type of blob which I have just described, where the speed or the rate at which your ice is growing becomes infinite and you trigger a jump. So it's at this time, really your boundary advances by non-zero amount. There is a second type of blobs where the rate of the boundary motion <coughs> becomes infinite, but there is no jump, so it goes back to the well-behaved regime without a discontinuity. So, so you have sort of this, you know, uh, vertical asymptote that again we have to imagine, and then you know your your boundary becomes again continuously differentiable and nice without the jump. And so if you want to understand uniqueness in this problem, so the uniqueness of these global solutions, you have to actually understand you know all three types of behavior. So the well behavior the classical behavior that you can describe by PDs, this behavior in the presence of jumps that uh, I, I tried to describe on this slide, and the behavior where you have a blow up in the sense that the derivative of your boundary blows up, but you don't have a jump. And the third case, which I didn't talk about at all here, is turns out to be the most difficult one to understand, but I believe we can now understand that as well, and this leads to uniqueness of these global solutions as well. So I'll stop here. Questions? What are the physical implications, what are the implications to physics of uh, what you ah, Okay, so there is a group in Oxford of actually experimental physicists very interested in these problems. And what they found, uh, of course, it's very hard to distinguish discontinuities from some very sharp you know, spike or something. But what they find is that 
So the results behave, so they basically measure the temperature at the boundary of the ice and the water, and they do find that at the time where the ice is advancing fast, you, ha you see a spike in the temperature. So you kind of see this criterion uh, from the slide you know, in, in practice. So of course, you, you can debate you know, if, if the ice is really jumping or if it's moving just extremely fast and, and there is no jump. So that, that's very hard to distinguish in any kind of experiment, but the solution seems to describe. So in particular, in fact, uh, the way the rate of growth blows up, so there's some uh, exponent that governs that, this exponent turns out to match, seems to match what people see in experiments. So it's not such a terrible model of the actual behavior. Is there another question there? Uh, do you know anything in higher dimensions? Ah, that's of course an excellent question, and the answer is no. So, <laughs> so we will definitely look into that a bit. Uh, we spent the last two years on the one dimensional case, but so far there is nothing to report. <laughs> Other questions? Well, if not, we thank you. <laughs>